Psalms 103. Bless the, come on, read it with me. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name now. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all of his benefits. Who forgives how many? All your iniquities. Who heals all your diseases. That's our God. And he's standing there waiting for you to open up. And you say, well, how come some people get healed and some people don't heal? It has to do with being open up to get you to open up to God. It has nothing to do with God saying, I'm not going to heal you today. Okay? It's all set up. See, healing happened over 2,000 years ago. It's already set up like the electricity in the wall. But we've got to all learn how to plug in. Can you say amen? All right. So we're going to talk about the incorruptible seed. That's an old English word for a seed that cannot be corrupted. Can you say amen? All right. So good morning, saints. This is the day the Lord has made. We want to welcome the Holy Spirit to help us understand the word today. He's our teacher. He guides us into all truth. We want you, Lord, to open the eyes of our understanding, help our heart receive the word upon good ground. And, Father, we'll continue to give you honor and praise and glory for it. In Jesus' name, and everyone said? Amen. All right. So God has been giving us little bits of wisdom. You know one of the main ones. Where aren't our eyes supposed to be? The world people, and ourselves. Now, if you would even get close to that, your life will literally change. But what's happening is all of our problems come from without to within. What, what we see with our eyes, often we judge. Sometimes what we hear with our ear, we often make an, our opinion. And if Christians, if we would just practice what I'm going to share with you, we will grow and develop, and God will be so pleased because he is our master. Can you say amen? He is our shepherd, good shepherd, and he helps us to grow. Now, you know, you think about that. Have you anybody here ever taken care of goats, maybe llamas or, you know, alpacas? I had a few for a while. You know, they're not always as pretty and cute as they look. Any shepherd has to deal with ugliness, you know. And dirty sheep. Hello. So we got to get the idea is that God receives us all. He's the good shepherd. And he receives it in whatever condition we're in. And he wants us to come to him. So we learned the first thing we need to do is we need to come to him. Can you say amen? And the second, we need to ask. Everyone would say, come to him and ask. Amen. So he's already came to us, didn't he? Two, over 2,000 years ago, Jesus came, died, and rose again. So he already came to us. Now he's waiting for us to come to him. Now, remember what I told you before. Don't forget this. That is, God has set himself up in this planet. The planet he bought back. He purchased anybody that will call on him. But here's the scenario. The reason why we see the devil so active now is because God runs on coming to him and asking him while the devil pushes, shoves, lies, cheats, kills, destroys. The thief cometh to kill, steal, and destroy. Jesus said, I've come that you may have life and you may have it more abundantly, right? Amen. So he's standing there to give us abundance, but often we're distracted by too many things on the side. So let's look at this. So he gave us a little bit of wisdom for us to really work on. I think Christians need to really work on themselves and not try to work on someone else. Now, you think about it. What did Jesus say? One of the first things that he told his disciples, he says, look at guys. You know, the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew, you know, where Jesus talks all these things about, you know, we're going to go through that and, and show you some things. And one of the things he says in Matthew 7, he says, why do you look at everybody else's fault and don't consider your own? Notice how quiet it got <laughs> instantly, you know. But see, here's the key. It has to do with our sermon today. If we're paying attention to our walk with God and loving people where they're at in God, 
we won't get meddled up and fiddled up in the affairs of life, and we won't get slowed down by the lies of the devil. I'm looking at a lot of people that don't know how revival starts. We're all asking for revival, right? But it starts in your heart by you disciplining yourself before the Lord so that the fire gets hot. And then when you talk to others, you only takes a spark. To get a fire going. You know, hey, let's get together and gossip. <laughs> you know? And so the idea is we need to, this little sermon God gave me, he says, son, this is, everybody's asking me for revival, but I can't work with bricks. I work with living stone. I said, what do you mean, God? He says, People are so caught up in what they're doing, they haven't got time to do anything I asked them to. And then they cry out, Lord, change me. And I'm doing my best to change them, but because they have a human will, they resist me and don't even know they're doing it. So this sermon will help us. Everyone say amen. All right, good. Go with me to Proverbs chapter 1, please. We're going to look at the last verse, verse 33. The key for us to do and to be healthy and what he wants us to do is to become doers of the word. We found that out a week ago. It makes us mature. It causes us to be stable. And by the exercising of our faith in the word, it causes God to develop in our heart. Amen. How many know... Now. We're going back to the seed for a minute. I'm going to talk to you about the seed. How many know that circumstances can either help a seed or hinder a seed? In other words, plenty of sunshine, plenty of water, plenty of good soil, right? That'll help a seed. But sometimes the elements around the seed, winds, snow, you know, all of this, negative elements, do they help the seed? No. So here's the lie. The lie is, you grow by life's experiences. Well, you learned some things by life experiences, didn't you? But the seed inside of you is who? How does he grow? By life's experiences? No, the seed in you grows by the exposure of God. Okay, now listen. It's really, even a child can do it. That's the thing. Satan wants you to think it's like some intellectual formula for you to do all these things. No, you have a seed in you that will do all of those things for you. His name is God. But he only develops and grows as we expose ourselves to him and then by faith act on what we know in the word. Hello, and you're not going to start off as a champion, even though God considers you one. Are you with me? So, for, uh, I like this. So, Proverbs, listen to this, gives us the key. Now, Jesus ran around and said, Those with ears, let them what? Hear. Hear. Did you know your hearing will be tainted if you have a preconceived idea about something? Let's say you believe this is it and this is the way it is, and then you hear the truth. You're going to wrestle with that in your mind. You'll need to accept the truth like a child. Listen to this. But whoever listens to me, Proverbs 1, 33, will dwell what? Safely. So what is the key for us to dwell happy and safe? Everyone go, two ears, one mouth. Listen twice as much as you talk. Why? I love to talk. Well, I do too. But until our words are filled with good things, sometimes we need to limit our talk because it hinders our walk. Scripture tells us too many words we sin. Too many things we dream dreams. I picked beans one time when I was a kid. I picked so many beans I dreamed about it. So let's move on from here. He who listens to me, say, I got ears to hear, Jesus, and will dwell safely and be secure. 
and quiet from evil. That's you. But you got to be listeners. Mary and Martha, remember Mary and Martha? What did Mary do that Martha wasn't? Martha and Mary were wonderful Christians. But the story is there for our learning. Martha was caught up in all this thing and all that going and everything. And Mary sat at the feet of Jesus. My words to you are this. Learn to sit at the feet of Jesus so you what the things that you do are done well. He that becomes a doer of the word shall be blessed in what he does. So listen to me. You'll dwell safely and be quiet and secure from any evil. Amen. See, that's me. You see, when we surrender and receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, he comes in us. And he comes into us as a complete package. Everyone say complete. Now here's the fallacy. When we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we just get a portion of God. Is that right? No. That's why God is God, and that's why he set this up. He literally deposits the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit into your spirit. He injects himself into you by your request. You believe in your heart, and you confess with your mouth, it was made unto you salvation. God came in, in complete form, into your spirit. <coughs> now, the problem is, you are now a complete package. And what's the first thing that happens to a seed? So, if you want more power and expression in your life, you've got to get out of the way and die. Sounds real creepy, doesn't it? <laughs> you've got to crack off the old life, because I will tell you, I've been in the ministry, you know, a short time, but a long time, short time, about 40 some odd years, and I've seen all through the years Christians at different levels of growth, and I went to God and I said, God, why do we have that? Is it is the fact we got a 40-year-old Christian that doesn't act anything more than like a person that just gets born again. How does that happen? Because they won't let the old life crack off of them. They're holding on to the old life. So the new life is, shh, is what do you call it, when a plant is stunted. That's the word I was looking for. I had a brain moment. <laughs> Stunted. And many Christians today are stunted because their focus has been outwardly looking for things instead of focusing with God and saying, God, change me, change me, get me ready, change me, change me, get me ready. And then going on and by faith, trusting God in what you're doing. And so God, you know, he's in operation. You're under construction. Can you say amen? And it's great things. But you see, then the enemy comes in and says, now don't you be so excited now. You look at this and you compare yourself with that. And you say, remember, your idea is a lot better than God's idea And next thing you know, the old hard crust starts to come up. And anytime you feel that old man coming, go see Jesus. Now, if you are like faithful people, and you are, you see Jesus first before the old man creeps up. Everyone will look at your neighbor and say, thank God you've changed. <laughs> Don't do that. All right, so let's get into this. I hope you laugh a little bit. I learned to laugh at myself. I mean, if I can't laugh at myself, you know, other people will do that for me. Let's go on. All right, so we come to Jesus, we surrender. The Bible says in Matthew that it says, make sure that you Surrender to your adversary while you're on the way with him, lest at any time your adversary turn you over to the to the soul to the officer, and the officer turn you over to the judge, and the judge throw you into prison. How many of you remember reading that scripture? Here's the simple understanding: when before you got born again, you were in opposition to God. You had a different God, a serpent God, whether you knew it or not. And then when you accepted Jesus Christ, you surrendered. You made an agreement with who you were in opposition with, God. And say, God, I don't want to be at odds with you. I surrender. All that stopped. 
but the people that go all their life and will refuse God and won't just surrender to God, you just keep praying for them because they're going to be turned over to the to the officer, and the officer going to march them right up to the judge, and they're going to get exactly what they sowed. And if it's sin, that's not a good sign. Say, no, 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 no. If the wages of sin is, yeah, we don't want anything to do with that. Now, you're going to make mistakes. That's not the sin he's talking about. And for Christians that are born again, you're a child of God. You're not a sinner. So that means that even if you do make mistakes, it is dangerous. It will hinder you. But your job is not to run around doing your own thing. You realize that you're going to serve God. And our life begins when we leave this planet. You should see the mansion you have in heaven. You just keep being faithful, keep loving people, keep doing what you're supposed to be doing. God says, I have mansions for you. And they're based on your love for me and your care for others. Not yourself. Don't care for yourself above anyone else. You're on the bottom of the chain. Hello. Because caring for ourselves gets us in trouble. Look at your neighbor and say, he's talking about himself. All right, so 1 Peter, please, look at this. Chapter 1, verse 22 and 23. This tells us exactly what I've been telling you. Listen to this. This is cool. All right, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 22 and 23. Since you have purified your soul, where is our soul? It's your mind, will, emotions, appetite, intellect, and personality. We have purified it. We cleansed our soul by obeying the truth. See what it says? Come on. Follow along with me. Don't lose me here. Since you have purified your soul, you want your, you want your brain clean? This is how you do it. You purify your soul by obeying the truth. And God only asks you to do little things at first. Hello? Through the Spirit, in sincere what? We love God, we obey Him out of sincere love, don't we? And of the brethren, we, so let me put it together. Since you have purified your souls by obeying the truth, through the Spirit, in sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently. Be excited about caring and seeing people. With a pure heart. Now listen to this. Having been born again. That's you. It's talking about you. Having been born again. Not of corruptible seed. But what? Of incorruptible. Through the word of God. Which lives and abides forever. How did you get changed well, somebody came along and said, would you like to receive Jesus as your Savior? And you were at that point where you came to the end of yourself and you said, I would. And they say, well, repeat after me. Lord, I surrender. Jesus, come into my heart. Forgive me of my sins. Be my Lord and Savior. And Lord, help me in this life. You don't have to do so many words. You can just call on the name of the Lord. God is waiting. Remember, he set himself up waiting for people to come to him. God is still waiting for people to come to him. And all this time I've been preaching and sharing with you about meeting with God first. Some of you still aren't doing that. How could you even like yourself without you meeting God first? I mean, I don't like myself. Hey, two days without Jesus makes me a miserable boy. <laughs> right? How can you do that to yourself, not meeting with God faithfully? And then you are married. How can you do this not praying with your wife? And then you run around smiling and think you're on revival. No, you're a disobedient child. That's not, that's not good. So the only way we can become obedient is simply cleanse our soul by obeying the truth and sincere love of the brethren. Amen. Are you with me? Because we're born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, born by the word of God. So you have a huge, wonderful, God-like nature on the inside of you that you have to actually take care of. You see, when you bring yourself before God, you strip your body off and lay it onto the altar. And then you and God commune and you talk and you share and you talk and you share until he fills you and tunes you and causes your flesh to die out so that when you get up out of prayer, 
you're a champion and not the old loser that you were when you went into prayer. Now, come on, don't look at me in that tone. Because some of you always said, oh, I sure did that stupidly. You know, how many times have you talked down on yourself? Come on, we all know the old self. I'm not happy with my old self. My old self did a whole bunch of things I'm not happy with. But you're not the old person. You're the new person with God in you. Now let's get God out in everything you do and say. It wasn't recently that I've been to a couple of meetings and they called me to do something. Not, not recently, I mean about 20 years back. They called me to do, come on over and we're going to do this and everything. I said, well, let's just sit and, and fellowship around God. Because when you sit and you fellowship around God, God shows up. You brought him, and now two or three are gathered in my name. There am I. And all of a sudden, if you continue to talk about it, the power of God begins to move. It so moves so strong that, uh, that, it, that it, you can feel the electricity down deep. People are looking for waves when they're missing the ocean. You see, hello? Smith Wigglesworth didn't look for revival. Everywhere he went, he started one. And true men and women of God, wherever they go, they spark things. Things come alive. Why? Because they're carriers of God. You're carriers of God. Don't forget, you're the donkey carrying Jesus into Jerusalem. Don't take the glory to yourself. You're the delivery system. Your mouth should be good. So when you speak, it encourages others. It helps them to be straight and right on. Can you say amen? All right, so let's go on. So you're born not of corruptible seed. Now, our text is Matthew 13. Go with me there. Verse 31 and 32. How many here don't know what a parable is? It's a story to prove a point. So if you're a farmer, I'm going to tell you a story about God in farming. If you're a carpenter, I'm going to tell you a story in carpenter. Jesus did all these things very wonderfully. So here's one right here. Another parable he put forth to them saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field, which indeed is least than all the other seeds. But when it is grown, it's greater than the herbs and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and rest in its branches. What in the world? Who's the seed who lives in our heart? Who, what's the field? It's the earth. God, seeing that the earth was totally corrupt, and sent his son as seed into the earth. Hello. Amen. And it's developing. Now, take a look. Jesus has come, and he's gone, but yet Jesus is here. And all of you, and all the millions of others, you read the scripture in John, it says, and the word took on flesh. Remember reading that? John, in John, first John, not first John, but John chapter one. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. All right. And the word took on flesh is the old King James. And listen, did you know the word of God, which is Jesus, is still taken on flesh? You and you and you and you. People are joining Christ. Why? Because he's building a body in the womb of the earth. And one day that trumpet's going to sound, we're all going to get birthed out of here. <laughs> Hallelujah. So you're part of the pearl of great price. You're part of the kingdom of God. So let me finish this. And he, a man took Jesus and planted him in the earth. That's our father. Which indeed is least in all the seeds. When he came, did Jesus come in pomp and circumstances? No, he came in as a little pauper carpenter's son, didn't he? In what town was he born? Nazareth, in Bethlehem, right? Bethlehem was a real dump. Hello. It's like being built or being born in the hood, in the alley, in the hood. Do you understand? 
Jesus didn't come with any reputation. He came for one reason, as a seed, so people would swallow him and receive him so that he could take over this world again. Now, you're part of a rescue program where God has deposited a seed in you. Now, the condition of Christ and God in your heart has a lot to do with how much distraction you're distracted by. How many other interests are playing for your attention? Moving right along. You still, you're not mad at me, right? So let's go on. So we know the seed is Christ. The field is the earth. If people receive the seed, Christ, they will be saved. The seed in our heart is God. And our relationship with him is what caused God to develop inside of us. You see, when a child is born, usually they're born complete, aren't they?
I will division. The word enmity means division between you and the woman. Okay? Between your seed and her seed. Are you with me? Between her seed, excuse me, your seed and her seed. And he shall bruise your head. The word bruise your head in the Hebrew means he will crush your power and make you useless. And you shall bruise his heel. It's a prophecy. Jesus is going to come of a seed of a woman. Now, who, ladies and gentlemen, adults, this is adult section, um, who carries the seed in the male and the female? The male does. Seed means offspring. Okay? In this case, the seed of a woman. Okay, it can't, I can't, it works now. Okay. The seed of a woman, she received of the Holy Spirit according to the word of God, and the word came into her womb, and the word took on flesh, and Jesus was born. He didn't have the blood of a fallen man in him, so he was without sin, yet he came like a sinner. So he could take our sin and pay for every debt that we owe. See, he's already paid for your future mistakes. Duh. So concentrate on him. Wouldn't you like to hang around somebody that's already forgiven you of everything you could ever think of or do and says, I'll receive you as a little child? It'd be kind of stupid to not come to him. Well, we don't, many people don't come to, to God because they think it's religion. I don't come to God. I don't, I don't want that religious stuff. People hurt me in church. And then you'll start. I says, well, you didn't get God. You got religion. And religion is that old crusty shell that needs to crack off. Steady. Here's one for you. That, that's just a little notice there. Okay. Attention right the back here. You see, that little distractions... It, the idea behind it is to keep that old shell on you. As long as you've got your old shell, you're going to be hindered. So what you do is you go to God and say, chip away, Lord, chip away. <laughs> Crack that baby off. Amen. Chip away. Talk about yourself before God. God, I need help. I need help. I need help. Lord, you know the little goofy things I do and think that really are not right. Clean me up inside. You know, you talk to God that way. But you have to come and you have to ask. And not think, I'm thinking God. Yeah, you look like you are. Powerless. Now, so there's a seed war going on. Satan is bidding for you. Satan is playing for you. And for everybody in the world. He's playing for your children, your grandchildren. He's there doing his job, tempting and trying to tell God, I'm going to take all these people from you. And God's patiently waiting and he says, I know the people that really want help will come to me. Right? So here's the sad part. Why is it you and I didn't come to God until we ended up being so miserable? That's about the only option we had. Not everybody, but some people. Why is that? Because our pride is that old crust. And we have to fall on the rock. The Bible says if we fall on the rock, we'll be crushed. Now listen carefully. But if the rock falls on us, We'll be ground to powder. Who's the rock? So when you take your life and you fall upon the rock, Lord, I'm sorry. Fulfill my life. I'm going to hear and do you the best I can. You're going to have to help me, Lord. You see, then God will destroy your outer man and bring out the newer man. But if you choose to resist God and what he wants to do in your life, eventually when you stand before the Lord, you'll see that your whole life is nothing but powder. 
didn't amount to anything. He did it for you. All right, moving past that. So there's a war going on for the hearts of men. Everyone say, greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. Go with me to John 12, please, verse 23 through 26. There are two kingdoms we're going to point out, the kingdom of darkness, kingdom of light. Can you say amen? Now, I'm just going to keep simple. They're fighting against each other. You and I have already been rescued. We've already been brought back. We've already been furloughed. We're not in a battle for ourselves. If you are, you're missing it. You're in a battle for the souls of others. Your battle has been won because you have who in your heart? And when you go to him every day, anything that might rebel, your flesh, is dealt with at the first of the day because you're faithful to meet with your captain, with the author and the finisher of your faith, the one who's begun a good work in you. He will finish it, but you've got to keep coming to the physician. How many here have medicine you have to take every day? Why do you think he's not medicine? Anyway, so John 12, 23 says, but Jesus answered them and said, the Pharisees were all talking, and he answered them and says, the hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain, now listen to this careful, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone, but if it dies, it produces much grain. What did Jesus do? He came as a seed and he died for our sin. And when he rose again from the dead, he gave us an interesting tool. Everyone say, what is it? The word of God. Now, think about it. This is where people go wrong. They don't think that the word is God and the God is word. But you can't separate them. The word is God. In the beginning was God, it was the word, and the word was with God, the word was God, right? So the word of God, you can't separate. The word is how God pieces parts of him to you. Now, you received God as a whole package inside as a seed, but then you go to the word, and you get bits and pieces to confirm with the word because the word is God. So every time you receive the word, you're receiving seed. Can you say amen? So every time you receive the word, you're receiving seed. Okay, so don't forget that. All right, so go with me to Mark chapter 4. We're going to pick up the parable of the sower real quick. Okay, remember the parable of the sower? Jesus actually said, Mark 4, okay, verse 13 through 20. Remember the parable of the sower? Who's the sower? Anyone that shares the word, right? Who was the first one to share the word? The father. The father so loved us, he gave his son. And the word became flesh, and it dwelt among us. We beheld his glory, full of all the glory of the father. And then we started writing about him and piecing him and talking about Jesus. And they got put down in, in, in word form. And now we study pieces of Jesus so that it will confirm to our soul you see, you don't read the word for your spirit. you got God in your spirit. Can you teach God anything? No, you need to teach your head. So God in your spirit and the words from the page and the words you hear my mouth speaking are teaching your head what to do and how to get out of the way so that God can develop in us. Can you say amen? There we go. So, and he said to them, do you not understand the parable of the sower? How then will you understand all the parables? The sower sows the word. And these are the ones by the wayside, where the word is sown, where they he hear the word, and Satan comes immediately to take away the word sown in their heart. Folks, everybody, when they hear the word spoken properly, receives it with joy. But they have the same struggle everybody else does. They have the old man. Remember the old man? Remember a long time ago, your old man before it died? It does and has been conditioned to listen to who? 
See, your body has not been conditioned to listen to God. Hello? That's why you fall asleep whenever the word's out. Hello? Your body rebels again. That's why you leave your body in your car and come in here in the spirit in church. You haven't learned that yet. Let's go back to class. Okay? You can't come and sit in a sermon and be mad at the pastor and get anything at it. You can't come in and sit in a sermon and, and I say, why are you here? My mother brought me. You're not going to get anything. You've got to come to Jesus and ask. Come to Jesus and ask, which means it has to be your heart. Oh, you see, you come to Jesus and ask out of sincere heart. All right, so let's go on. So the wayside people are the ones that hear the word. They're, they're happy about it. But who comes? Who's afraid of the word? Satan comes. So you get a brand new person in here. They hear the word for the first time, and they get saved. They, they come to the altar and ask Jesus in their heart, who do you think is going to jump on their head when they leave this place? It says right there. So what are you older saints doing? Praying for the new one. Every day until Christ be formed in them. Or at least as much as God lays it on your heart. But we don't. They come on in. And, well, I wonder what happened to so-and-so. Call them. Moving right along. And then it says... And these are, these are the ones of the wayside. Okay, now, listen to this. And likewise, these are the ones sown on stony ground. Everyone say stony ground. Wow, man. No, stony ground, okay? Stony ground is lots of rocks in your soil or head. Amen, let's go on. And, and likewise, the ones sown on stony ground who, when they hear the word, see, they're hearing the word, immediately receive it with gladness. And that they have no root or stability in themselves. And so endure for a time and then run off and do their own thing. And afterward, now listen, this is what Satan does. They get a hold of the word. They've been coming to church for about three or four weeks. And then Satan, listen to what he does. He begins tribulation and persecution arises because of their word's sake. And immediately they're offended and they stumble. You see, if you don't know and have a real strong relationship and want to get with God so your roots go down, Satan can convince your head that what you're doing is you're just being weird. You're just being one of those religious. You've gone off. You've just come to a... You just... I don't know what it is. Did you take too many drugs? Why are you a Christian? You know, Christianity is just a crutch. You ever heard that one? It's just a crutch for you weak-willed people. I look at him, I smile, and I laugh, and I says, Jesus is not a crutch, because I can't limp my way into heaven. Jesus is a stretcher. He has to carry me there. That way I don't get credited or not credited about anything. It's not my own works and my own righteousness I have done, but according to his mercy he has saved me. So let's go on. I'm not boring you, am I? I well, didn't hear enough. Let's just close right here. <laughs> the idea is having understanding of the words so that the rest of the Bible comes together. That's what I, we want. We want the Bible to come together for you. Because if you don't understand your insurance contract, what are you going to do if you're getting sued? And what I mean by that is Satan's always suing you every day, accusing and suing you. I'm going to get you, and I'm going to get you. But you know what? You shouldn't even be listening to that turkey. Why are you listening to someone who can't even tell the truth? He's a habitual liar. Let's go on. So stony ground, Satan comes immediately. And because of the word, they are offended. Tribulation comes, and they fall away. Now, now these are the ones sown among thorns. This is the most tricky one. Everyone say thorns. Do men gather grapes amongst thorns? No. Do you pick figs with thistles? No. Neither do men want to hear you talk if you're just a crabby old thistle. That's what he's talking about. So listen to this. This is pretty cool. And he says, those on the thorns are those that hear the word. But the cares of this life, 
the deceitfulness of riches and the lusts of other things entering in that chokes the productiveness of the word and it becomes unfruitful. In other words, Satan sells an alternative. Cares of this world means worries. You worried about your bills? Where are you going to live? Jesus says, don't do it. Let me worry about it. You serve me and love me, I'll take care of you. But if you get out there and start doing it, I'll just step back because your pride keeps me from helping you when you're doing it. Hope you got that. Hope you got that. Okay, so we back off and let Jesus guide us. Can you say amen? No. So the ones among thorns, the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches. How many know Jesus said, it's hard. how hard is it for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven? It's easier for a camel to go through an eye of a needle. In other words, it's impossible. If you trust in your riches, you cannot be saved. And if you do get saved, your walk is going to be knee-high to a grasshopper. You probably get in, but that's about it. And you'll say, where's my mansions? Where's all that? Because you were into yourself and your, what you were doing, and you didn't care about anybody. How about writing a big check to help somebody? You see, when that rich man came to Jesus, and he says, what must I do to be saved? Jesus quoted part of the Old Testament, remember? And he said, all of these things I observed from my youth. And Jesus seen his heart, and he says, there's one thing you lack. You put money as your God. So what you have and make me God and I'll make you more money. Hello? We always try to get ahead of the horses. We try to pull them. We try to lead our life and make the decisions. Trying to always tell somebody what we should be doing because I know it's God. I know it's God. Well, listen, if, if it's God, he would have told me too. I listen to God. Wouldn't it be terrible if I didn't, George? Is that man listening to God? I'm pretty, anyway, let's go on. So cares of this world, deceitfulness of riches, and the lusts of other things. Everyone say lust. We always put this terrible thing on the word lust. It just means wants that you can't control. People that are, eat too much, you're in trouble. When you eat too much, you become larger than you want to be. Okay, and the people that don't eat at all become sickly. We have to have a balance in everything we do. Can you say amen? Or what we do might mess with you. Hello. And we don't want to do that. All right, let's move right quick. Almost done with you. And these that are sown on good ground are such as hear the word and receive it with respect. Bearing fruit, some 30, some 60, and some a hundredfold. Every, <coughs> Does anybody here not understand 160 and 30 fold? Put your hand up. Do you know what 30 fold is, 60 fold is? Just imagine you have a field. And if you have a 30 fold field, that means 30% of that acreage produced. If you have a 60 fold field, it means 60% of the acreage produced. If you have a hundred fold field, it means everything's producing good. You are the field. And God's the seed. Hello. So as you follow God, you start to produce a 30. Be 30% God in you and 60% you still. And as it switches, okay, then it becomes what? 60% God and 40% you. And then as you continue to walk with God, suddenly it becomes all God. And you're just along for the ride. Isn't that wonderful? I get up every morning excited because I'm along for the ride. I'm not making God's decisions for him. Moving right along. All right, everyone say, I want to know the seed. All right, so listen to me. How many of the Christians in their heart can't sin? Here's someone I'm going to blow you away with. You don't sin and make mistakes from your spirit where God lives. Everyone, listen careful. When you go out and do something wrong or you made a mistake, it comes from here. It comes from your flesh. Okay? Because the flesh is clumsy. That's where you, you bash your hand with a hammer and all that kind of stuff. But all the perfectness come out of your spirit. And this is why Paul says walk in the spirit. And you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. 
For they war against each other. Seed war. Cain and Abel. Seed war. Your old man hates your new man. And your new man wants to ignore your old man. Because God's in it. Can you say amen? (laughs) And what you need to know is because the seed's in you. And if you are listening to God in your heart. He's not going to let you get angry. But you'll get angry on your own. And then God will say, what are you doing? Oh, God, I'm sorry. And then he gets it straight, right? That's called an inward conviction. We need to learn to be sensitive and follow God from the inside out. There's a song that says, from the inside out. Not from the outside in. Inside out. And you see, the Bible says if we follow God from our spirit, God will never lead us into temptation. He'll never lead us into testing and trial. This is not the Old Testament. Well, why do Christians go through testings and trial? Because they made that choice and didn't know they were making it. If God says, don't enter door number three and you go in, don't say, God, why am I suffering this? (laughs) So, That's the difference between religion and relationship. You have a relationship with Almighty God. Never forget that. Please don't compare your walk with other churches and other things because you'll stumble when you do that because you are the only you there is. So make it right with God. Can you say amen? Let God make you who he wants you to be. And he doesn't want you to be anything else but a wonderful God-fearing person that he chose you in the original form to be. And finishing. Jeez. Carry, hurry up. All right. <laughs> we need to let God, who is God, be God to order our steps in our lives. Can you say amen? So 1 John chapter 3, verse 8 and 9. When I first read this scripture, it disturbed me because I didn't understand it. This is years ago. And God gave me clarity and understanding. And that's what I'm trying to do with you. So 1 John, not John, 1 John. That's towards Revelation. It says, for this purpose, listen, for this purpose, the Son of God was manifested. Now, who lives in your heart? The Son of God. So he's manifesting in your heart for this purpose. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifest that he might destroy the works of the devil. Can you say amen? Every time you bring God into a situation, if the devil's there, he's going to split. I've been in places where every devil in the last block moved out of the way because the light chases away what? Don't forget that, Christian. Or maybe there's too much of you in the way and the light's not getting out. Uh Uh-oh, moving right along. And it says, he was manifest that we might destroy the works of the devil. Whoever has been born of God, raise your hands. All you that have been born of God, come up, put your hands up. God loves the testimony. Are you proud or are you ashamed? All right, periodically I'm going to ask you to do things. Don't resist it, just do it. You're missing out on a blessing. Obedience. Now, not to me, but to God. Now, listen to this. I love this. Whoever has been born of God, that's us, does not what? Does not what? I had problems with that. Because I know I blow it all the time, George. But did you know there's three parts of you? Spirit, soul, and earth suit, body. Your earth suit is already cursed. That's why you get old and get sick. That's why you need to expose it to God to keep it healthy. And to the word, keep it healthy. But we know that that's going away. We're going to get a new one. Can you say amen? It's going to be remade. All right. But inside your spirit, who lives? Now, your spirit. Now, this is what Christians don't understand. Your spirit and God's spirit mingled. God's not sitting over here in your spirit, and you're sitting over here in your spirit. You're mingled like you would mingle sugar and cream to coffee or tea. 
You be, God and you have become one new creature in Christ. Now, can God sin? Boy, you guys don't have a real solid answer. Can God sin? Who lives in you? Who are you following? Guess what? Then you're going to find yourself making fewer mistakes, having fewer problems, and revival will start growing in you because you're focused on the God in you and what he wants to do, less focused on your life and what you think you should be doing. Make sure it's God. It's okay. And less interested in what people say to you. If you're one of those people that get offended easily, you're not where you need to be because you're ready for a setup. Some people wear stuff on their a little chip and they're just waiting for people. They'll knock it off. Go ahead, say something weird. Get on my case about something. Listen, I'm the pastor. Every, I have to answer for everything here. And if you're disobeying God, I got to tell you, how fun can that be? So moving past that and finishing. We have to follow God in our heart. Hello? When we do, we become untouchable because Satan can't. He has, you see, what happens is Satan has to reason with us and lie and talk to us. And we have to be listening so he can draw us out of ourselves, back into our old way of thinking. So every man's tempted, listen, in James, when he's drawn away by his own lusts and enticed. Babies don't like rattles until you rattle one. Then they want it. So Satan sells you on things. I'll make you a preacher. He can't make anything. Didn't he come to Jesus and all these kingdoms I'm going to give you? If you just fall down and worship me. All right, so what should we be doing, Pastor Kerry? What should we do? Number one, you focus on on your relationship with God and his joy and the things he gives you. Ask God to help you not criticize or look at the faults of others because there's plenty out there. I have plenty of faults. That's why I don't want you looking at me. I want you to hear the words I say and the things and, the re and know that the reason I'm saying them is because I love you. Gosh, I, how would you like to tell your parents? Your mom's trying to tell you when it, you're about ready to get married and she's trying to give you the advice of your life and you go, don't you lecture me about being married. And that's what people sound like when God's trying to help us. Don't you lecture me about how I run my life. Listen. So I don't need to. You're making a big enough disaster yourself. Hello. So the idea is to help one another, build one another up. Amen. Keep our eyes off the world, off of other people. I mean, yes, it's all right. I enjoy my nephew. My gosh, there's a miracle sitting there. I, the fact, every time I see him, I'm glad he's alive. But beyond all that, he's a man. He has all kinds of... I look at you and I, I rejoice over that. When people look at me, you know what they do? They run. <laughs> yeah, they do. Oh, <laughs> hope he doesn't see me. And you know, I hear all, I'm in prayer now. This is the last thing I'm going to say. I'm in prayer praying for all of you. Listing you out by name. And God's not tattling on anybody. But he does tell me what you need. And so you want your pastor to be informed by God, don't you? You know when we come out there and give the latest news broadcast? <laughs> you want me to get what I get from the throne of God for you, don't you? Well, good, then pray for me and take good care of me, all right? Amen. Don't crucify me. Would you help for lunch, the pastor? <laughs> I, I'm telling you, it's because I just caught, you know, a bunch of people. God told me a whole bunch of people taking upon their liberties to criticize. Don't criticize anybody, okay? I might deserve it, but don't criticize anybody. Don't, don't, don't get up there and criticize the presidents in there, Okay? You know, you might not like everything like pray. You're to pray. You don't like it, change it by prayer. 
You start criticizing, and you're going to step over in what I call antagonistic spirit. Antagonistic spirit causes trials come your way. It's when you make an off-handle remark. That is a real blank. You're antagonistic. God's not like that. Jesus never was antagonistic. Can you think of one time, I know you can't, so I want you to point this out, where Jesus looked like he was angry and he was doing something heavy duty. Anybody? Anybody? Bueller? When they turned over the money temples, right? And in the 23rd chapter, read it, of Matthew, where he told the people, he says, look, you look religious, but you're full of dead man's bones. You're all a show, but you have no love in your heart. He rips them a big one because God doesn't like religion. Religious people said, crucify him, George. That's why when you meet a religious person at church, you get, yeah, I don't want to go to church. That's the whole point of having that religious person there to say hi to you. So you'll get insulted and not want to come back. Hey, listen. I don't care if your pill bottle fell down on the floor and your pills went out. You still have to take the pill, boo-boo. Hello. Whether you like me or not, I have pills for you. And these pills are the gospel. Hello? It's the only pill you can take that will heal all your, your flesh. So just shut me off and listen to the words. If you got something out of that this morning, we give the Lord praise. Amen.